Ja, god dag. Klokka mig gick lite fel. Klokka mig gick lite fel så det var säkert nog med. Sommertid eller vintertid, vad heter det? Sån där. Ja, det fortsatt alla som skönar norsk här. Ja, då är det här med bestämt att det kurser här kommer att gå på norsk. Det är ju en lättelse, är det inte? Jag kanske jag trubbel med dialekten min. Så det kan jag liksom gå åt på engelsk. Ja, är någon som har någon lure på? Har ni tänkt nu har till dem så här helgen nu eller har ni drömt om andra ting? Andra ting. Helst andra ting. Vad heter du? Ja, det var då damen där har spurt. Du ja. I didn't I haven't seen you before. Yeah, I was in your class and my friend. Okay, so you want to have this course. They said I had to. Oh, you have to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I was introducing this class in Norwegian saying that uh, asking in Norwegian is everybody speaking Norwegian here and I didn't hear anything from you. Yeah, you didn't understand that, <laughs> you but now you understand what I asked. Okay. Then we have to move into English then. Okay. So what's your name? Yenka. Yenka. Did you take the exam? Yes. Uh, did you uh, are you happy? Very happy. Very happy. Okay. So it was a good grade then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Yenka she's a master student in uh, event management. And sport, sport management. And for some reason she wants to take the take this course. I don't know why. Somebody <laughs> has probably told her. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Do you need any information about the course? There are two textbooks. Uh, yeah. uh, there is one American one and one I have written and they are available in the bookstore and uh, there is no uh, lecture notes on the web but there is videos and from today on they these videos will be in English, okay? So you're from uh, Belgium? Belgium? Yeah. Maybe we should do it in French then. You speak French? That's your native tongue? Un petit peu, ah, oui. Très bien, as we say in French. Yes. So, do you do you understand English? Yes. Good. There it, it, it turns out we have a, a student from Belgium here, so we we will have to satisfy her needs, uh, meaning that uh, we will continue in English. Okay. Hopefully, do this doesn't stop you from communicating. You can. Talk to me in Norwegian if you like, ask questions in Norwegian and I will translate it and uh, it will work like that. Okay, of course if you want to speak English, it's free to you, okay? It's a, it's a good opportunity to learn some. Okay? English is important, okay? If you don't speak English, then you're nothing today, so that is uh, definitely important. Okay, last time we talked a little bit about mixed strategies. We ended up last time discussing this concept of mixed strategies and we didn't finish it so we have to So Jenka, do you have an experience in game theory? No, not that you know. Okay, then you have no experience in game theory. Okay. And we have been discussing some game theory already in this course. Uh, so you just have to read back on the on the textbook, okay? Yeah. Um, uh, I took an example last time. Let me repeat that one, okay? Just to make certain that we understand this. Uh, suppose we do these experiments. We we flip a coin, and there is either a head or a tail. Head means mint tail means krone or the other way around. I don't know, but it doesn't really matter, does it? So either it's a head or a tail, and if there's a head, uh, you're paid two dollars, if there's a tail, you're paid one dollar. Okay, so we flip this coin several times, and then we can res register what happens here, okay? And then we get this stream of outcomes, do we? So let's say it may look like this, one, one, two, one, two, two, Like this, for instance. Okay? This is the result of flipping this coin. 
uh, and the amount of dollars we get for each flip. Okay, so in the first flip there is a tail, the second there is a tail, the third there is a head, and so on. Okay, so we, we get this uh, stream of numbers, and we discussed on how to compute the average last time, didn't we? The average income this kind of game would give us. Okay, it would be something in between one and two. Do you agree? That uh, seems reasonable. It can't be below one, not on top of two due to these numbers here. And of course we can, can compute the average straightforwardly by just adding these numbers. 1 plus 2 plus 1 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 1 plus 1 and of course divide by the number of observations here. So this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So we have to divide by 9 here. And if we compute this on a calculator we get some kind of number. Okay. But uh, I'd like to focus on kind of looking at this slightly differently. We can count up the number of ones here, can't we? There is one, two, three, four, five ones. So these can alternatively be written like, be, be written like this. Five times one plus one, two, three, four twos. Agree? Four times two divided by nine. Okay? That's an alternative way of doing this. And of course we can continue separating here, so we can write this as follows, as 5 over 9 times 1 plus 4 over 9 times 2. You see these two numbers here, 5 over 9 and 4 over 9, if we add them together, what do we get then? We get 1, don't we? Will we always get 1 if we do this? Now suppose I do this more times than this, 2 or 5 times more. Of course this number increases, doesn't it? There could be more 1s and more 2s, but of course the total here must be the total of observations, so we'll always get a 1 here. Okay? And this number here is what we call a probability, isn't it? This is, in this experiment, is kind of the chance that we get a 1 based on these observations. Okay? Of course, if we use a fair coin, we can say, okay, then we should know that the probability of getting a head is 50%, and the probability of getting tail is also 50%. So in that case, we would change these numbers, wouldn't we? We put in a half here and a half here. And then we would use a kind of probabilistic model to compute this average. This is kind of based on the actual observations we make. The point here is that we can kind of compute this average by this method, as I discussed previously. We can kind of take the probability, multiply it with the outcome, take the other probability, multi multiply it with that outcome, and if there are other outcomes, of course, we, we can do the same. So this is the way we need to compute expected values, as we call them. The reason why there's two different names here, average and expected value, were Norwegian, Forventningsverdi, and Genomsnitt. Just to inform you, okay. Expected value in English is called Forventningsverdi in Norwegian, okay? And average, as you probably know, is called Gjennomsnitt in Norwegian. I have to go through this. What was your name again? You, yes? Jenka. Jenka, with a J. I try to learn the names here. There is Christian, Tina, Simon, Charlotte. No. How are Henriette, og nesten, slutta på E. Markus, nei. Det var en Markus som begynte å sitte her. Han er ikke her i dag. Nei. Sorry, I'm uh, moving into Norwegian. I'll move back to English. <coughs> the point here is that when we kind of talk about expected values, then we kind of put down a probabilistic model. So then we kind of define the probabilities and use that to compute the expected value. The alternative, when we look at averages, then we observe. 
And we really do it and see what we get, and then we just add together and divide by the number of observations, or the number of experiments. So there you see this kind of, these are two, two different concepts, but uh, our need here is to kind of do it like this, to compute expected values. So that's the reason why I spend a little time on this here, to be sure that you kind of understand the difference between these two concepts. Because I know that some of you perhaps haven't seen these concepts before. Okay, then we're back to the mixed strategies. And as we discussed last time, what we do in game theory by introducing mixed strategies is to add or change the decision space of the, of the player. Kay. So instead of making the player choose one strategy or another strategy, we say that we let the player choose a probability instead between these two strategies. And I kind of try to visualize that by saying, okay, if there are a certain strategy here and a certain other strategy for player one here, and if there is other strategies, T1, T2, for player two here, then of course choosing combination or possible choices is these four points. And I also said last time that these four points have a nasty characteristic. They kind of construct a space which is not linked together. It has holes. It, this space has a lot of holes in here. Okay. This is the part of the space and everything else is a hole. And by introducing these probabilities, we allow the player here to choose any number along this line. Player one, Player two can choose any number along this line. So his, his, his task now is kind of to, to fix a point here. And this, the task for the other player is to fix another point there, choosing a number between zero and one by assigning a value to this probability. And by doing that, we kind of change this space from being non-convex, as it's called in mathematics, into a convex space, a space which is linked together with no holes. And that is the reason why we, in this situation, is able to prove, although we are not going to do it here, that there is always a solution for the Nash equilibrium. This was proved by John Nash in 1950, and he got the Nobel Prize in Economics for that achievement in 1994. So this is an important point in game theory, okay? We can always discuss whether it's sensible to use these mixed strategies. Do people really do this? Do you, as decision makers, when you play games, do you randomize, as you say? Do you have some kind of mechanism in your head that makes it possible for you to do things at random? Most people don't. At least I don't have that, maybe you have. But uh, if you observe what people actually do, and some Israeli researchers, I think, did some empirical analysis on penalty kicks, and as we will see later on, penalty kicks, they kind of ask for these mixed strategies. But that's kind of something we will return to. It turns out that if you observe these penalty kicks and kind of look at one player and see how he shoots, in what directions he do it, it seems to be pretty random. Okay, so you cannot kind of find out how the next shoot will be. Okay, that is kind of what you would like to avoid, isn't it? I think also there's been some studies in handball. Of course, whether you, ho you, you, you hear these hon handball players talking about, what do they call it? Drawn corners? Yeah, you know, they, they try to find out how other players shoot at them, okay, to try to go at the right side. But of course, if these other players are intelligent, or if they understand game theory, then they will kind of know that they shouldn't shoot in a way which is kind of preferred. Or at least if they do that prefer, they must kind of mix it with other ways of doing it, making confusion for the keeper. And that is kind of the idea here, underlying this. So it's kind of a logical thing, relatively straightforward. But there's been a lot of criticism related to whether people actually do it. But as I said, there is at least lately a fair amount of empirical evidence indicating that if people don't randomize, at least it seems like they do it. Okay? And that is uh, 
maybe a, a different thing, but at least it kind of supports this way of thinking. <coughs> okay. Okay. Now, if you recall last time, sorry, I just have to get some water on this. So again, a kind of revamp of some necessary probabilistic theory. Okay, that's uh, So, Yank, are you interested in football? Um, so -so. Ah, <laughs> finally, somebody who's not interested in football here. That's wow. always a great pleasure. What did you say? I will not say that I'm not interested. No, but you're not very much interested. Mm -hmm. So, what kind of sports are you interested in? I play tennis. What? I play tennis. I play sing. tennis. Tennis? Yes. Tennis? Yes. Oh. Have you been playing tennis? Yes. At what kind of level? Um, yeah, it's kind of hard to explain, I think. I don't know how I didn't know it. But uh, I, I played um, um, in my youth, I played uh, international. So you played international tennis? Yeah. Representing Belgium? And then I quit, so. Okay. So you have a kind of career as a top athlete then in tennis? Yeah, a long time ago. Long time ago, okay. I'm not very good at tennis. Uh, do you anybody else of you very good in tennis? It seems very easy, but when you try it, it's very <laughs> difficult. That's my experience, at least. It, uh, of course, my body is not built for tennis. It's not built for any kind of sports activity, as you probably see, but uh, that's a different story. Okay. Last time, we looked at the game example. Uh, let us repeat that one. It was this game between this character called odd and this character called even, wasn't it? And it was played by each of these players putting either one or two fingers at the table at the same time. Okay? And it, this kind of game ended up in a description like this. If even is here, uh, he could either put one finger or two fingers on the table and this other character called odd could do the same, one finger or two fingers, and then we could make this table, which then constructed the payoff based on the following rule. Um, if the number of fingers seen from top on the table was an even number, then the price was paid to even by odd on one something. Okay, So one one is two, which is an even number, so in that case 1 is going to even and minus 1 is going to odd. So this is a zero sum game because they kind of interchange money here. Normally we don't add pluses here. Same here and then the opposite here, isn't it? That was the kind of game we looked at. And what we did last time was to look for Nash equilibria. And we do that by maximizing this column, maximizing this column, maximizing this line, maximizing this line. And it turned out we did not have any sub square which had both a circle and a square in it and that means there is no Nash equilibrium in pure strategies in this game and the idea by introducing these mixed strategies is to try to show you that looking at this game or to be perfectly correct not exactly this game but a game that looks like it we can demonstrate by introducing these probabilistic structures that we end up with a Nash equilibrium that is the point here. So I want to demonstrate that even though we cannot find a Nash equilibrium here, there is a Nash equilibrium hidden behind here. 
which we will reveal by introducing these probabilities. That's the idea. To make it easier, we look at a simplified version of this game. So this is a simplified odd events game. And uh, the idea, of course, is to avoid too much computations here. So I don't want to kind of expose you to unnecessary complicated mathematics. That's the, the reason why I do this. And the way I simplify here is that I remove all the minus ones, I think. Let me check. That one. That one. Yes. That's what I do. I take out all the minus ones and I put in a zero instead. Okay. So let's do that. So I keep these positive ones there and there and I put zero in instead of all the minus ones. That makes it much easier. Okay. The point is that the structure is the same. Okay. One is larger than zero. One is larger than zero. One is larger than zero here and one is larger than zero. So you see we get the same distribution of circles and squares. That means that these two games are what we can call strategically equivalent. They produce the same best replies. So although there is some minus ones here, some zeros here, they kind of work the same and that's the point. So this game does not have a Nash equilibrium and this game does not ha have a Nash equilibrium. But as I say, there is one hidden in both of them. Okay. So what we do now is that we introduce probabilities. And of course these probabilities, there is one set for one of the players, another set for the other player. So let's call P1 minus P here and let's say Q1 minus Q here, just to label these two different probability densities. As we already have discussed, adding together probabilities in the probabil prob probability density must always produce one. Okay, so you see that holds here. P plus one minus P equals one, doesn't it? Same here. Q plus one minus Q equals one. So at least we have to make that work. Okay. We add together probabilities. We have to cover the whole possible possibility space. That's what this means. So in this game, of course, there are only two options. Either you put one finger or two two fingers. Nothing else is allowed here. Okay. So this probability of one means that either there is one or there is two fingers on the table for this player. Same here. That's the meaning of one, basically. Okay. Now, let us compute something. Let us compute the expected payoff for player one. It's the guy we called even. So now we suddenly call him player one and player two to avoid writing this long name so even and odd. Okay. This expected value is kind of the the center of gravity for a set of numbers, okay? And if you bet on something, it may be a reasonable strategy, don't you agree? To try to do it in a way that you, you on average, gets, gets most money back. And that's what, what, kind of what we're doing here. We're kind of taking care of the fact that there is a, some kind of uncertainty here by computing the expected value. And instead of maximizing the payoff now, we'll be interested in maximizing the expected payoff as a kind of measure on, on average, what will be best for us. So when we introduce uncertainty in such games by pro pro probabilities, then we kind of have to change our objective. What's interesting for the players could be, and seems reasonable, that on average they will get best out by following certain strategies. 
So that's what we start doing here. Try to compute the expected payoff for player one. Okay, what kind of options is it for player one? He could either get a one if he is there. Okay. So one is an option, which is that one. Or you could get a zero there. Or you could get a zero there. Or finally he could, could get a one there. Of course he, he gets this if he himself is putting one finger and his opponent is putting one finger, then he get that value. Okay. These other values, they depend on what he does and what his opponent does. The next question is, what is the probability of getting this one? Okay. Now we have the probability that player one chooses one finger, don't we? That has a value of p. And we also have the probability that player two puts one finger. That has a value of q. So this, to be able to get in this route, both this event must happen as well as that event must happen. This one is with the probability of p. This other one is with the probability of q. If you recall last time we kind of discussed the probability of getting one coin, uh, sorry, one head and another head. It turned out to be a half times a half, didn't it? Then we also discussed this card game. Then there was some kind of conditional probabilities that we had to take care of. But in this case, there is no link between these two. This is private information for player one, so to speak. That's his decision and that's the other player's decision. So they are kind of not linked to each other. That means that the probability of ending up here is simply p times q. Just like head and head, a half times a half, but no, it's not a half, oh, it's p and q. So the probability of getting this one is p times q. The probabil probability of getting zero is not very interesting, is it? Because if we're interested in calculating the expected payoff here, then this zero would contribute making nothing. Although it's, it's straightforward to find it here, isn't it? This probability for this route would be p times this probability, 1 minus q. This one is 1 minus p times that one q. The final one is interesting. That is 1 minus p times 1 minus q. But of course, when it comes to contribution to the expected value, these ones doesn't matter because they are multiplied with 0. So now we kind of have our input which is needed to compute the expected payoff. Because we just use it here. It's the probability, p times q, of getting this value, 1, plus is the probability of p times 1 minus q, of getting that value, which is 0, plus is the probability here, minus p times q, of getting that 0, and finally, 1 minus p times 1 minus q times that one. Okay? This one vanishes and that one vanishes because it's multiplied with 0. Okay? So we end up with this term and that term. And of course, as it's multiplied by 1, we can just remove the 1 here and sum up p times q. Of course, now we know to need to know how to multiply two expressions with parentheses with each other. That's one by taking that one times that, that one times that, that one times that, that one times that, and keeping track of the signs. Okay? You know how to do this? Do you know this sentence? Have you seen this one? Okay. Good. We don't use th that one here. This is something we may come to need later on. Who knows? In any case, we have to take 1 times 1, which is 1. And then we I normally do that and that, and then move to the second. Of course, you can use your own technique here. But I normally start here, multiply with that. Then I take that one with that. So then it's 1 times minus q. So it's minus 1 times q. And then I move to this one, minus p times 1. 
and then finally these two minus p times minus q okay that's how you compute these expressions with each other in general of course if there is something like this the problem is of course that every student should know this the reason why I do is, is that most people seem to forget it I don't know why maybe because they didn't learn it when they had it in the seventh or eighth grader whenever it was okay so this is x times a x a plus x b plus y a plus y b it's kind of this rule I apply here now you understand different numbers here x is 1 y is minus p and so on okay so I have this expression and I have this expression and I want to add them together you see minus p times minus q is pq isn't it minus minus is plus so I get one part of pq here and another part of pq there it must be 2 pq as a consequence so let's move over here the expected value expected payoff as we say in game theory for player one that's what we're computing here okay so there's p times q plus p times q that's two pq isn't it that one plus that one and then there is a plus one a minus q and a minus p the final part that interests me so what did, did we do here we have a game with the matrix or the table on the, on, on the board then we add two sets of probabilities p1 minus p q1 minus q then we use probability calculations to do this argument and then we use our knowledge of how to compute expected values by performing this calculation here and we end up with this result this is kind of a function isn't it it depends on the value of p and q okay so this is a payoff function for one of the players which contains his own decision in this case p for player one and the other player's decision q that's kind of what we wanted wasn't it and then we're kind of looking for a best reply based on this function so what we're interested in doing now actually is to we name this p o p q so people use this term EP expected payoff as a function of P and Q what we're interested in is trying to maximize this EP OPQ with respect to the decision variable for player one which is the probability P and that will have to be a function of the decisions for the other player this is what we discussed at some point in this course then we said suppose there is a best reply function that may look something like this which is continuous in this case it will be that it will be a continuous function in q when we maximize out the p so you can think about picking some value for q here then we will try to find what value of p makes the result as big as possible that is the best reply for that value of q and let's pick another value of q and keep on like it that until we can kind of establish this pattern here and then do the same for the other player producing perhaps something like this and then hopefully there will be an intersecting point which is the Nash equilibrium this is kind of the mechanics first we find some function which contains decisions for at least two players sometimes even more than two players and then we try to perform this operation to find the best reply function this is exactly what we did here isn't it we did the optimization here depending on the choices the, the change now is that the choices is not either this or that it's a value now suddenly it's a continuous value of a variable 
called Q in this case. Okay. Now, let us move on. Now, if you don't understand something, now you must ask me, okay? Obviously, this is not the easiest part of this course. Uh, I can see that, okay? But uh, we just need this stuff here. Okay. Now, let's try to establish this function here try to perform this stuff here. So let's just choose some values for Q, okay? Let us in 1. And then, of course, I put a 1 on this one to mark it. So this is the equation I think about when I write 1. So let us in 1 choose some values for Q, okay? We try to kind of do this not very advanced, but as simple as possible. So let's pick just one value for Q. Say, as the first choice, Q equals zero, okay? That means, given this choice, we can change this expression by putting Q equal to zero into it, okay? Then we get two times P times Q, which is now zero, plus 1 minus p minus q, which is now 0 due to this assumption. This one vanishes, this one vanishes, and we're left with a very simple expression, 1 minus p. And what we're interested in now is to find what value of p makes this expression as big as possible. That is our best reply to our opponent's choice OQ equal to zero. Okay, so what is, what value of P should we put in here to make 1 minus P as big as possible? You see there is 1 minus P here, okay, so if P is growing, then this number becomes smaller, Do you agree? If P is a half, 1 minus a half is a half. If you take it down to zero, 1 minus zero is 1. And of course, p is a probability, so this p must be something like this, okay? All probabilities must be positive, and they should add together to 1, so they cannot be negative. Okay? No probabilities can be negative, meaning that in order to make this expression as large as possible, and then we often tend to use a star here to note that this is the optimal solution. So p star here equals zero. That expression makes this expression as big as possible. You agree? Given that p should be between zero and one, the highest value we can get to one minus p is by putting p equal to zero. So that is our optimizing variable here. It's the value of p that makes this one as big as possible. So a p star equal to zero is the best reply our first player can do, given that the other player chooses to put his probability equal to zero. Okay, that was one. Let us move to two. Of course, now we change our Q to something else. You may ask what and why do we change it like this? Of course, there is a reason, okay? But we can, in principle, we can pick anything we like here. Just to try to get some feeling for the pattern, okay? What happens here. So, second alternative. Let's put Q equal to 1, okay? We change it to the other extreme. First we start with a minimal Q, then we look on a maximal Q. 
if q equals 1, no, I took out the equation. That was silly of me, wasn't it? Sorry about that. Is it here? Yes. So I write it up again. Equation 1. E P on PQ was to P Q plus 1 minus P minus Q. I still have to use this one when I do these calculations. Silly to take it out. Okay. If Q equals 1, then we get 2 times P times now Q is 1 plus 1 minus P minus Q which is 1 now. 1 minus 1 vanish it, does it it? Plus 1 minus 1 is 0. 2P times 1 is 2P. 2P minus 1P is 1P. So this returns a single P. Like the opposite, if you like, of the previous case. And of course, in order to get the maximum value of this expression, we try to make p as large as we can. The larger it gets, the larger the p value gets, of course, it's as it's the same value. So, we, no, not we, we maximize E, what did I call it? E P O P given Q equals to 1 in this case, which equals P by putting P star equal to 1, as large as we can. Okay, that was the second case. Then let's move to the third value for Q. Three. And now we pick Q equal to a half. In between. Okay, we start at one extreme, move to the other extreme, and then in the middle between. Okay. Of course again, we just enter Q equals a half here for that one and that one, and then we calculate the consequences. We get two times p times a half plus 1 minus p minus q which is a half now okay straightforward just putting q a half into this expression produces that one 2 is possible to reduce here so p times 1 returns p plus 1 minus p minus a half p minus p is 0 isn't it so we get rid of the p here. 1 minus a half is a half. So here we end up with a fixed number equal to a half. But we, we must still perform the optimization here, or maximization. So again, we ask ourselves the que question, what value of p should we put to make this expression as, as, as large as possible? In this case, of course, it doesn't matter. Because p is not a part of this expression. So no matter what value we put for p, it is still constant. So that is the optimal decision. So here, our optimal p is actually the whole interval from 0 to 1. Any value of p produces the same value here, and hence a maximum, or a minimum if you like, but that doesn't matter. So no matter what choice we make for p here, that would produce the optimal value of the expected payoff. Okay, now we can move on. We can move into even shorter distances, for instance, picking q equal to 0 0.25, 0 0.75, and so on. So let me just <sighs> see if I had the answers here. Yeah, yeah, I just write out the answers. You can check that yourself, okay? So that would be case 3 and 4. In case 3, q equals 0 0.25. In that case, we get the same as in the first situation. This one. 
then p star equals zero. Uh, in the fourth situation, we can say q equals to 0 0.75. Then we get this other extreme, p star equals one. So what we have done now is to construct one, two, three, four points on one, two, five points actually, isn't it? Yeah, one, zero, and a half, and now 0 0.25, yeah. So there's five points, now we have found. Okay, let's try to plot these five points in a diagram, okay? So, let's have Q here, and our result P here. So what I would like to plot now is for different values of Q along this axis, or resulting P's on these other axis here, okay? And we started out with this one. If q equals zero, p equals zero. That must be this point here, okay? That point. That comes from this one. And then we got another point. And the second one we looked at, I've taken it out now. In that case, when q was equal to one, then the optimal choice was to put p equal to one. That produces, if this is one, this is one, this point, doesn't it? This is our two first points. First we put q equal to zero, then we put q equal to one. Zero produces, produced an optimal p of zero, which is the zero, zero point. This other one produced the optimal value of p of one, which is this point. The third choice we looked at produced this one, this whole interval here. And that came up for q equals a half, okay? So a half is in the mid between here, meaning that this whole line here must be a part of our best reply function. Because this is not what we're doing, isn't it? We are kind of spanning out this space of different Qs, and we find optimal Ps. And that is what we have defined as a best reply function. And then we have these two observations here. If Q equals a half, then we're down uh, a quarter, then we're down here, isn't it? This one produces that point. And we have this point that's up here, 0 0.75. We get another point up here. It's still one. Of course, if you continue doing this, you will see that it goes like a full line here and a full line there. That's how the best reply looks in this case. Kind of like an S, although not completely an S. Okay. Now, in order to solve the game and find the Nash equilibrium, then we have to repeat these for the other player as well. We have now only up to now looked at player one. Everything we have done here is to find his optimal choices of piece. We have to reverse and do the same for the other player, finding the cues, depending on the piece. Of course, what do you think will happen here? Then, of course, we get another graphic like this, and it turns out to look exactly like this. Yeah, you think I'm joking now, don't you? No, I'm not. This is actually what happens. It turns out to be a swastika, or a hockey course in Norwegian. But uh, now it's time for a break. Okay? Then we return, talking about Nazism later on.